hi everyone uh, welcome back uh, from the uh, 30 minutes break uh, so we now move on to the next uh, item so uh, the next item is the plenary uh, talk uh, by uh, professor chris bad and uh, uh, professor chris bad is a british mathematician and he's especially known for his contribution to uh, nonlinear differential equations and the applications in the industry uh, he is currently a professor of applied mathematics at the University of Bath and a professor of geometry at Gresham uh, College. And uh, today, uh, uh, Professor Chris uh, Bad will be uh, presenting on the talk Moving Meshes in Non Convex uh, Domain. So, uh, Prof. Bad, uh, we are honored to have you today. Well, it's really pleasure, great pleasure to be here. So, let, let's um, share screen. Um... Hopefully you can see all that fine. Um, well, thank you for the, the invitation. I'm really sorry not to be with you in person. Uh, I've heard lovely things about Ghana, and I, I do hope I can visit you at some point. Uh, funnily enough, my son, who works in uh, machine learning and mathematics of that, is going to be in Benin next week, so he won't be very far away. So uh, if you see another bud, floating around that 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 will be my my my, my son um, so i'm going to talk today about moving meshes which is a subject that i've been interested in for many many years and we're going to have a look at uh, moving meshes when you're looking at differential equations uh, in non convex domains and the the key feature about these is that uh, solutions of pdes in non-convex domains typically have singularities uh, and that's why you need to have some sort of moving mesh and, and this is a joint work between myself uh, Simone Appela who did most of the work who's a PhD student of mine just finishing uh, going off like everyone else to be a data scientist and uh, Tristan Pryor who is a colleague of mine also at the University of Bath Right, well, let's uh, set the scene then. Um, so the idea is that we, we want to solve a partial differential equation. And imagine that we, we want to solve this using some sort of uh, method. Uh, typically, that might be a finite element method, discontinuous Galerkin, for example. And if you have a finite element method, then you need to construct a mesh to do that. And I'll call the mesh tor. And as the uh, solution of the PD evolves, or as we understand more about the errors that we're making, when we solve the PDE with the finite element method, we, we generally want to update the mesh uh, as part of the solution process. And there are typically two different ways of doing this. Uh, one is called mesh refinement, and in mesh refinement methods, you might take a mesh, which might be, say, triangles, and if the solution of your PDE has a, a high error, then you might want to divide that triangle into smaller triangles to reduce the error. And that's all generally called H-adaptive, H being the idea of the step size, the mesh size, and adaptive meaning you, you reduce it to um, reduce the error when solving the PDE. An alternative method, which is called R adaptivity or, or mesh relocation, is where you take a mesh with a fixed number of points, and rather than subdividing the triangles, you move points closer to each other where you think the solution may have a high error or move them further apart where the solution may have a lower error. And this is called R adaptivity or relocation adaptivity. And one of the key ways that, is that differs from H adaptivity is that if you move points around, you typically keep the mesh, the number of points in the mesh fixed and the connectivity in the mesh fixed. Now, if your PDE, is a parabolic or hyperbolic PDE where you have some notion of time evolution, 
then typically the mesh will move as the solution evolves. And then that's why these methods are often called moving mesh methods. Okay. So this is the idea. And, and basically I'm going to talk in this talk about the, the way that you might move a mesh or relocate a mesh and how that can be done very effectively, even if you're working with problems with singular um, solutions. Now, relocation technology is relatively new. It's um, not been around for as long as the kind of um, H adaptive mesh refinement and the kind of big codes that are typically adaptive codes do adaptivity by H adaptivity. But there are many, many advantages that R adaptivity has over H adaptivity. Um, one is that um, you can have very nicely graded meshes. I'll show you an example of this in a minute. Um, so when you have an, uh, if you have a triangle and you divide it into two, you get a, a jump in your mesh size where it goes from one to two, which is quite a big jump. Whereas if you move the points, you can have much more graded meshes. So you can get nice regularity bounds from that. Um, another is that when you develop meshes, you always want to know what the quality of the mesh is. That's generally uh, expressed in terms of skewness or small angles and something. And that's quite hard to control with an H adaptive method, but is actually very straightforward to control with an R adaptive method. Um, another advantage of these methods is that because you've got a, a constant mesh connectivity and constant mesh number, um, the topology of the mesh is unchanged. So when you're doing H adaptivity, um, you might have some sort of ordering of your mesh, but as you start to refine, so the ordering gets very complicated and you have to build quite complicated data structures to deal with that. Um, if you just move mesh points around, then you don't need to do anything like that. You have constant data structures and life gets a lot simpler. And finally, if you're doing things in parallel, if you're keeping the same number of mesh points, then it's much easier to balance operations um, over the mesh. So there are many, many advantages that R adaptivity has over H adaptivity. Why isn't it used as much? Well, one reason is that it's somewhat harder to set up. Um, it's very easy just to divide a triangle. It's harder to move mesh points around. And a second is that it's got a bit of a bad reputation um, for introducing tangling in a mesh where mesh points cross over each other. And, and that mean, means that people are kind of reluctant to use it for that reason. But I'm going to describe a method which completely avoids that problem, which allows you to, to, to build meshes without any problems of tangling. So there we are, that's the motivation um, behind moving meshes. And that's what I'm gonna be largely talking about today. Um, so here's, um, to whet your appetite, an example of a moving mesh or, or an R adaptive mesh for computing the solution of um, an elliptic differential equation um, within a T-shaped domain. So T-shaped domain is a, is a non-convex domain. Uh, you have re-entrant corners. Um, and at the re-entrant corner, you have a singularity of the solution. The solution gradient becomes infinite as you go towards the corner. Um, that, you know, if you're solving a problem like an electrical field problem, that will correspond to an infinitely high electric field. Um, and so you need, in that circumstance, to have a mesh which is refined close to the corner. And, and here is one that we've generated using the technology, which I'm going to describe in some detail in this talk. Uh, and you can see that the um, mesh has really got quite a lot of very nice features. Um, it's, it's concentrated by the corners, which is where you need it to be concentrated. Um, it's got nice regular triangles. Uh, there are no small angles in the triangles. Uh, this, and you've got lovely grading towards the corner. And so this is a mesh that one would be very happy to compute the solution on, typically using some sort of a discontinuous uh, Gerlurkin method. DG methods are, are very appropriate for problems when you've got um, non-uniform meshes. So this is kind of the objective. And what I'm going to show in this talk is firstly, 
how you can construct such a mesh, uh, both in a most general case and then in the specific case of problems with reentry corners. And then I'll show you how you can prove that the mesh that you end up with has very nice global regularity properties, which can then lead to uh, very accurate solutions of the underlying PDE. So that's our, our overall motivation. Um, just to say one thing, what I've shown here is a, a mesh for a two dimensional problem on the plane. Uh, the methods I will describe can also work on curved manifolds. You can do meshes over the sphere and can work in three dimensions um, or even higher if you want. So there, there's no real limit to what you can do. OK, so how does our adaptivity work? So the idea between our adapti in our adaptivity is that you have a mesh, going back to our picture here, uh, which has cells. Um, here are our cells here. Um, and if something interesting is going on, for example, if there's a singularity, you want the, the cell to be small. In other words, you want the cell to have a small area. So the basic idea between behind how these things work is that you have some function M, we call it a monitor function, which is large where you want the mesh to be refined. So if there's going to be a large solution error, M could be a monitor of the solution error. And you simply arrange so that the monitor function times the cell area is constant. And that means that if the monitor function is large, then the cell area must be small. And equivalently, if the monitor function is small, then the cell area is large. And that's the basic idea. It's called the equidistribution idea. This is a very old idea. It goes back to De Boer in the 1960s, if, if not before then. And um, in fact, um, uh, the uh, radon back in the 1915 essentially showed that almost any, any um, uh, transformation can be expressed in terms of this kind of equidistribution idea. So when you're doing mesh relocation, one of the first things that you need to think about is what would be a, a suitable control of your cell area what would be your monitor function that you want to use? Well, there's lots of different possibilities. Um, one which has been around for quite a long time, but still has a lot of mileage, is to make M some measure of the a priori error of the solution. So that could be, for example, an error, uh, a measure of the interpolation error of the solution. So if you interpolate a solution with piecewise constants, then the a priori error is proportional to the gradient. And if you approximate the solution with piecewise linears, then the interpolation is proportional to the curvature. So you might want norms to function to be the gradient, a norm of the gradient to some power, or the norm of the curvature to some power. So if that's your monitor function, that would ensure that the function u um, is represented well in some sort of interpolation sense. Okay, so that's one method. Um, another method is to look at the underlying physics of the problem. So a lot of my own work is done in meteorology and ask any meteorologist what they want to preserve and they'll tell you vorticity, always vorticity. So it's reasonable to um, have your mesh concentrated where the vorticity is large, so you'd make M the vorticity. Um, another method, which we'll talk a bit about later on, is you do a computation, you make some a posteriori or I error estimate of the computation, which in finite element methods is relatively straightforward, and then that becomes your measure. Um, and a final and really quite exciting new development is to combine all these sort of ideas with a modern machine learning and uh, you will train your method on a lot of examples and the, the method learns an appropriate monitor function from those calculations. And um, Jason Walbrook at Imperial College has been pioneering ideas along those lines. So that, that's how you might uh, choose your monitor function. And there's a whole sort of science associated with that. 
Um, so let's show you then how this works. Um, here's an example on the right of a mesh which has been computed um, by taking a monitor function which is large in a ring centered at the origin. And this is a mesh that we computed once for solving a problem in laser physics. And you can see that the mesh is, is really quite nicely concentrated around the ring. Um, and the way this whole process works is you take what we call a computational mesh um, in a computational domain, which is regular in every way, um, and you map that into the physical domain, and the map itself encodes the mesh within it. Now, if you do H adaptive meshes, then you have to talk about cohomology and all sorts of fancy topological ideas to describe the mesh. Um, in our adaptivity, it's much simpler. The, the mesh is simply the image in the physical domain of a regular mesh in the computational domain. So that's how the process works. Um, and as I say, you, you make that image concentrate the points where the monitor function is large. Um, so we, we think of this map then from the computational domain to the physical domain. We'll assume that this map is differentiable and has a Jacobian, um, which is defined in the normal way. Um, there's our map. Um, and then the uh, cell area in the physical domain is the determinant of the Jacobian or the modulus determinant of the Jacobian. Uh, the equidistribution requirement then becomes the very straightforward expression that the monitor function times the determinant of the Jacobian is a constant. So that's the equation that we're interested in solving to find the map from the computational to the physical domain. Um, it's a, a fully nonlinear equation, so that m times det j is constant. And that's our equidistribution requirement. Um, anyone that's uh, interested in measure theory will, will recognize this uh, M here as playing the role of a measure um, in the physical domain. Okay, so that's how we're gonna set up our mesh. So there's good news and bad news here. Um, in one dimension, um, the equidistribution equation, M det J is constant, constant being theta, defines the mesh essentially uniquely. Um, and this was understood ages ago. De Boer knew about this. Uh, codes like Colstis and so on use this requirement. Um, it's in 1D that requirement. If, if I ask you to give me an interval of length one, up to translation, there is only one interval of length one. Um, but in 2D or 3D, there is no such simple um, uniqueness. The, the condition number one, the equidistribution condition, doesn't uniquely define anything. If I ask you to give me a set of area one, then there's um, an uncountable number of sets of area one. So we need to augment this condition on the mesh with some other condition which specifies it uniquely. And there's, well, you open up the textbooks on mesh adaption and you'll find lots and lots of ideas on this. Um, but an idea I came up with in 2006, together with my student, Jeff Williams, who's now at Simon Fraser University, uh, which others came up with it at about similar sorts of a time, was as follows. Um, if you open up the great textbooks in numerical analysis about how to discretize PDEs, they, they go on at length about the, the very great advantages of having a completely uniform mesh to discretize a PDE on. If you have a uniform mesh, you get nice cancellation properties, you don't have problems with small angles and all that sort of nonsense. So the simple idea is, well, if uniform meshes are so great, why don't we find a solution of uh, the equidistribution equation, which is close to uniform as possible? And how can one describe closeness? Well, an easy way to describe closeness is saying that it has to be as close as possible in L2. So um, Jeff and I uh, thought, well, can we solve equation one um, by looking at the solutions of equation one, which minimize the deviation of the mesh away from a uniform mesh? 
So that's a simple idea. Um, but immediately we can see things that are going to happen in this. If, if we're trying to find a mesh which is close to uniform, the uniform mesh is untangled, and therefore we would expect the mesh to come, we come up with also not to have tangling. Secondly, a uniform mesh is not skew, so we would expect the mesh that we get not to be skew. So those are two things you might immediately expect. Now we can make this completely rigorous, um, but immediately you can kind of see the virtues of this idea. Um, but like everything in life, uh, you come up with an idea and you find somebody else has really thought about it before. Um, and in this case, the person that had thought about it was Monge, who was scientific advisor to Napoleon uh, during the Napoleonic Wars. Um, what's the idea behind that? Well, um, it was Monge who was looking at the question of whether you could move Earth from one hole to another um, as easily as possible. And he came up with the idea, which we now call optimal transport, of the optimal way to move Earth from one hole to another. So this is Monge's kind of problem. Um, and then the, it was realized in the 1920s that this uh, problem related very strongly to problems in economics, where you might want to transport um, goods from one place to another. And it was developed by Kontarevich, and um, became the, uh, the monge kontarevich problem. Um, and in the uh, 1991, uh, Jean Grenier in Paris, um, studied this problem in the context that I'm interested in it, where the, the difference is the, the L2 norm, um, proved a quite remarkable theorem, quite remarkable theorem. I'm really annoyed that he wasn't awarded the Field Medal for it at the time, because it's so amazing, this work. Um, and he proved that if you want to um, solve the equation M times det J is theta, which is the equidistribution equation, um, then there is a unique function which minimizes that L2 norm. This is the thing that we want to do. Um, so that tells me that I can construct a mesh. And then Brenier went on further. He actually showed a way of doing it. Um, he said that what you end up with is a function which is the gradient of um, a convex, um, what I call potential function, Phi. So the map from the computational domain to the physical domain, which equidistributes the monitor function and also minimizes the deviation from uniformity, is the gradient of a convex function phi. And this is wonderful. It's pure magic. Why is it magic? Well, it tells me that a mesh exists. It tells me that I can compute it. Um, and it tells me that I don't need to worry about complicated geometrical structures. All I need to do is find this function phi, which is a scalar function. And then once I differentiate it, I've got my mesh. Phi is a scalar function. So if I want to mesh in 2D, I construct phi and take the two-dimensional Laplacian uh, gradient. If I want it in 3D, I take the three-dimensional gradient. I can do 2D meshes and 3D meshes just as easily. Um, you can also do this on manifolds. You've got to work a bit harder, but you can extend Brenier's results. Um, Robert McCann extended Brenier's results to manifolds. Um, as I say, I was annoyed that Brenier didn't get the Fields Medal. Um, more recently, Figali, who was work, essentially extended Brenier's results, did get the Fields Medal. Oh, richly deserved, but Brenier should have got it earlier. OK, so um, let's talk a bit further. Um, it's actually slightly easier rather than using Brenier's result, where X is the gradient of potential, to let X be the, the uh, original mesh uh, plus the gradient of potential, which amounts to the um, uh, equation I put uh, underneath, um, which is a little bit better for um, domains with periodic boundary conditions and generalizes to manifolds such as the sphere. And you want to do the sphere if you're going to do um, meteorological work. OK, so, so that's um, Brenier's result. That doesn't tell us how to find the mesh. Let's see how we do it. Um, 
So if you take uh, the function x as xi plus grad phi, and differentiate it, um, then the Jacobian is um, the identity plus the Hessian, the second derivative of the potential. Um, the uh, governing equation then becomes the monitor function, uh, which is a function of x, which is in turn a function of gradient of phi, times the determinant of y i plus the Hessian of phi equaling a constant. And that is the equation that we solve to find our mesh. And this is called the Monge Ampere equation, named after Monge again, Ampere, um, the, the uh, great French uh, scientist in the 19th century. And if you write that down in 2D, uh, then it becomes that uh, fully nonlinear um, elliptic PDE, um, m times essentially the second derivatives of phi multiplied together is constant. So that's the equation that we have to solve to find phi. And once we found phi, we take its gradient and we get the mesh. Okay, um, just a little bit extra. Um, this is fully nonlinear. Everything you look at in sight is nonlinear. Um, uh, you augment this with boundary conditions, which basically are um, that the boundary of the mesh of one domain should map to the other, or if it's periodic, then you put in the periodicity. If you're solving on the sphere, you don't need boundary conditions because the sphere has no boundary. Okay, so that is the Monge Ampere equation. And there's lots and lots of literature on that. Uh, there's vast amounts of literature in, in geometry uh, um, journals about this equation. And there's a certain amount of literature in numerical analysis uh, uh, papers about how one solves this um, numerically. Um, now, I should say one thing that's really important. Um, <clears throat> I'm, we're talking here about generating meshes to solve partial differential equations. I'm interested in solving the PDE accurately, but most you don't need a brilliant mesh to solve a PDE accurately on, so we don't need to solve them on Jampere equation particularly accurately. So pretty well any method which solves it to some degree um, will be fine, providing it's stable and it's fast. Okay, so um, we're not we, we want to solve the equation in blue, but we don't need to solve it too well, and that's important because we don't want to spend a lot of time solving the mesh when actually what we really want to solve is the PDE itself. Okay, so that's the equation we're going to solve. Um, let's talk about how we, we solve it. Um, well, the method that we used to solve it um, was derived by Tristan Pryor, my colleague uh, in Bath. Um, this was before he came to Bath. I think he was in Reading at the time, uh, working with a PhD student called Lattic, Lackis. Um, and the idea behind solving this is rather like if you want to solve Navier-Stokes, um, you have a mixed finite element method, um, so you discretize velocity and pressure differently. Um, and in this case, uh, we uh, introduce a new variable sigma to represent the Hessian of phi, um, and then you, you discretize um, uh, sigma and uh, phi on two different function spaces, uh, V1 and V2. And you decompose the Monge Ampere equation uh, into uh, an equation for solving uh, for phi, knowing sigma, an equation for solving sigma, knowing phi. So in red, uh, we have the uh, mixed finite element uh, representation of um, the uh, uh, two uh, um, equations that we want to solve. Um, and we have slightly different um, types of um, uh, types of um, space. So typically, we, we want higher order space for sigma than, than for phi. Um, and, and here are the kind of different uh, types of space that we might want to solve it on. So we, we basically discretize the, the Monjamper equation using a mixed finite element method using these spaces. And I should say that. Uh, it was prior that came up with this idea, and then um, it was implemented numerically by Andrew McRae from Oxford uh, later on. Um, so this is how we solve it numerically. 
uh, we, we write it in weak form um, and there's the mixed uh, ele finite element uh, discretization. Uh, various ways of solving this. Um, you can either solve this in uh, a relaxation method. Uh, Awanu um, uh, came up with a very, very effective one. PMA is one I came up with earlier, which was anything like as good. Um, or alternatively, we can use some sort of Newton method uh, to solve two and three. And this is what McRae um, at Oxford uh, developed in order to be able to solve the mont -Jamper equation. As I say, you want to solve it quickly, so it doesn't really matter method, which method you use, providing they're reasonably fast. Um, so um, let's have a look at some examples. Um, the, um, here's a couple of examples that we're going to kind of think about. Um, the first, well, there are basically two cases. We, there's our monitor function up there. Um, and if you choose certain variables in the monitor function, um, it concentrates around a ring. And if you choose other variables in it, you concentrate uh, around a, a bell. Um, we, we use these as monitor functions because they, um, problems I'm, I'm particularly interested in problems in solving Schrodinger type equations where you might get singularities forming around rings or around uh, single points uh, concentrate co corresponding to various types of, of focusing uh, problem in, in lasers. So those are our two cases. Um, and here is the uh, solution if you use the relaxation method um, where you essentially take the mixed finite element method and iterate it uh, in a fixed point way for a number of times. Um, and this is a, essentially uh, an expanded version of a picture we saw earlier. Uh, and I want to kind of draw out various features on this. Um, you can see that within the ring, the mesh could not be more uniform. Um, outside the ring, the, the mesh has distorted itself to meet the ring, but it still has very nice gradient properties. Um, and around the ring, the mesh beautifully aligns itself in order to um, uh, kind of align the, the elements along the ring as you go around. So that, that really does look a very nice mesh. It has lots of nice properties associated with it. Um, and this is how the convergence works um, if you do an iteration. Um, and what you do is you monitor the, the residual of your um, finite element calculation uh, and, it, and it goes down nicely. Um, here's the mesh that you, you get if you have uh, a singularity in the middle. Again, I want to draw your attention to the fact that the mesh here um, in the center is again, extremely regular. Um, it's basically squares, it could not be more regular. Um, you get outside this, what I call the cloverleaf pattern, um, and you can prove exactly why you get this uh, as the mesh adjusts itself to fit the, the boundary of the domain. Um, and we do get some small angles, but they are not that small. And essentially you can, constrain the, the level of um, small angle that you get. So that, that's a perfectly good mesh. You could easily use that to compute uh, singular solutions of PDE. And in fact, we do that. So I've done a lot of work on blow up in the non insuring equation where the solution might get to 10 to the 100 in size. Um, at the same time, the mesh has a compression of a factor of 10 to the 10 and um, it follows it very nicely uh, throughout that. Um, again, the relaxation method to do that uh, works very nicely. Um, and just to kind of say how the, the Newton method works, this is the um, technique that uh, um, Andrew McRae came up with. Um, so there's our residual uh, that we have for the, the mixed finite element methods. Um, and typically we um, use a quasi-Newton method, which suppresses some of the dependency of M on the function um, and incorporates a nonlinear uh, solver. Um, and that works pretty well, actually. It's pretty robust. It's relatively easy to implement. Um, and in the green, uh, this is the, the ring problem that, that we looked at earlier. Um, you can see the convergence of the quasi-Newton method is significantly faster 
um, than, than the relaxation method. So in a sense, the method of choice then for solving, uh, for finding meshes uh, on the sort of domains that we might be interested in um, is to use uh, Quasi-Newton method, mixed finite element discretization. Uh, and that works very well for plane, it works very well for 3D, and we've also got it to work pretty effectively on manifolds such as the sphere. Okay, so um, the title of this talk has is Moving Meshes for Non-Convex Domains, and I've spoken a lot about moving meshes. What about non-convex domains? So let's have a, a look at this. And I was told when I started thinking about these that this could not be done. And the reason people told me it could not be done is you can't solve them on Jampere equation in a convex domain because you get singularities and so on. Um, and it was only after trying it that we realized that didn't matter. And I'll try and explain why as we go through. So we're gonna have a look at what is actually quite a classical problem, well, well studied in the literature, of how do we solve Parsons equation, uh, minus the Poisson U is F. Well, I'll assume F is regular um, and that, that U um, inherits whatever regularity you need uh, with Dirichlet conditions and Neumann conditions are on the boundary. And we'll have a, a convex domain the one I've drawn is what we call the L-shaped domain, uh, but you can have a number of different types of non-convex domain with a re-entrant corner, our, our label AI for whatever the corner might be. So that's, that's what we're going to use as our test problem. Um, and the key thing is that um, U, the solution, has a singularity at the interior corners. Um, and the way you can measure this singularity is that if R is the distance from the corner, so here's my corner, R would be some distance away from that corner, see up to there, um, then the solution looks like R to the alpha F of theta, uh, where theta is just angle, um, where F is a fairly slowly varying regular function of theta, but R, the, al the alpha value depends on the corner. So if you have a, 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 a L-shaped domain, the interior angle is three pi over two, so alpha is two thirds. So R, U R theta is R to the two thirds, F of theta. So its derivative is R to the minus a third, and that goes to infinity as R goes to zero. And there's our singularity. Um, so that's typically what things look like at corners. Um, and if alpha was, say, 2 pi, which is even worse, then you would look right onto the half. Um, so this problem has been studied forever. Um, Babushka and Guo essentially shoot an optimal um, Sobolov error estimate, uh, where U, U is in um, some weighted Sobolov space um, indicated as above. Um, so the challenge that we, we uh, addressed ourselves, and this was essentially the, uh, my student Simone's uh, part of his PhD, was to see whether we could adapt the kind of mont or optimal transport moving mesh method to work in this sort of context uh, and then compare the sort of errors that you might get uh, with an H adaptive method. Um, and we're going to uh, discretize this problem using a discontinuous Gerlurkin method. Uh, I won't go into any details as to, about the method. Um, suffice to say, it's, it's a, a classical finite element method um, where we're going to discretize uh, on a, a triangulated mesh. Um, we can see here the sort of mesh that we might be using. Um, this is a sort of sneak preview, is actually the sort of mesh that is constructed using the Monjamper type technology. Uh, where we have corner points and all sorts of nonsense like that. Um, so that, that's our discretization. I won't go into a great deal of dis detail. Um, we use piecewise linear uh, discontinuous Galerkin method uh, for, the, for the discretization. Um, one of the nice things about this uh, approach is that there are um, uh, good a posteri ori error estimates. 
And, and what I've shown in the red is uh, uh, one of these sort of typical a posteriori or I error estimates, which allows you to make an estimate of how big the uh, L2 error is or L infinity error is in any of the cells. Um, and then an H adaptive method reduces the cell size if that uh, estimate is large. And I've shown underneath uh, a typical mesh that you get when you do that, um, which I, I personally don't particularly like. It, it's, it's quite irregular in a way. Yes, it's refined close to the corner, but there's no sort of niceness. It's not particularly symmetric. Um, there's no good grading in there. Um, and so whilst that would give you low errors, you're not, it's hard to construct and actually the errors are going to be uh, increased by the, the lack of regularity. So that's the classical adaptive method for this problem. Um, let's have a look at um, how we might ad adapt a mesh using more of the kind of ideas that we've put earlier. Um, so the idea here is we've shown that a good way to construct a mesh is to solve a Monge Ampere equation. And in the context of the problem we're interested in, um, the main area we want to construct an adaptive mesh is close to the corner. So we may not have to solve the Monge Ampere equation everywhere. We may just need to solve it locally close to the corner. Um, and so our, our idea was, that, well, let's find a local solution, the Monge Ampere equation close to the corner, use that to redistribute the mesh and maybe use a monitor function based on um, interpolation or estimates. So that's the idea. Um, so um, the um, kind of thinking then further on is that the uh, key thing about singularity of the solution is that it's uh, a singularity in R, the distance from the corner, it's very slowly varying in theta. So we consider a monitor function, which is only a function of R um, and has no theta variation. Um, and the uh, monge Ampere equation, uh, if, if you do that, becomes a thing in black, M times R dr d theta is S ds d theta. Um, and uh, that reduces down to the very simple equation in red, M R R D R is S D S. And that is the Monge Ampere equation um, if you ignore theta dependence. Well, that's a nice, easy equation to solve. You don't even need to use a numerical method for that. Um, you can integrate up uh, that up very quickly if you know what M is. Um, and noting that the solution of the uh, underlying PDE looks like R to the alpha, we, we postulated uh, that a, a monitor function which might work might be R to the minus two gamma. Don't know what gamma is yet. Let's see what we can do. Um, if you substitute that into the Monge Ampere equation, you get the equation in blue. If you integrate up, uh, you get the equation in black. Um, and then the, the local mesh size, dr by ds, uh, just works out as being um, R to the gamma. So um, that is what gamma is. Um, it's essentially how the um, local mesh H scales as we go away from the corner. I can, we can actually work out what gamma should be in various cases. Um, if you look at interpolation error um, with you looking like R to the alpha F theta, um, then the infinity, L infinity interpolation error over a, a mesh um, of a cell of size H turns out to be H squared times second derivative of U, which is H squared R to the alpha minus two. Um, that tells me that um, H looks like one minus alpha over two, which tells me that gamma uh, in the solution of the Monge Ampere equation um, is optimized by taking um, it to be one minus alpha over two. Um, so for an L-shaped domain, alpha is two thirds. Um, so gamma is um, also two thirds. Um, and uh, in the crack, alpha is a half, so gamma is three quarters. So this is brilliant. It's, this tells me what the optimal value of gamma is 
um, and then that gamma can be substituted into the monitor function m um, in order to solve the monge Ampere equation to find the mesh. You can do the same in L2. Um, you, there's various technicalities and the way things work, um, but the bottom line is that the gamma um, for L2 is four ninths for the L-shaped domain um, and is a half for the crack. Okay, um, so how do we solve this? Um, what you do is you take that value for gamma, um, you need to regularize the monitor function a bit so that, that um, uh, it, it tends to uniform mesh away from the corner. Um, you can then solve the mont ampere equation uh, analytically um, and can complete the, the mesh by matching from the, the local to the global um, solution um, with that value monitor function and that value for gamma. And that, that procedure, it, it, it's almost more complicated to write down than it is to, to do um, because you've done most of the work by doing the, the analytical calculations. Um, and these are the sort of meshes you get. Um, so here is uh, an L-shaped domain where I've taken gamma here to be uh, this, this number two thirds. Um, and you can see the mesh that you get there. This is by solving the mont Ampere equation. I'd just like to compare that mesh with the one that you get from H refinement, which is that, uh, which is all over the place. Um, and this one is beautifully regular, lovely grading, um, matches the boundaries, um, got all the symmetries you could want. Um, here's the same mesh um, for a uh, crack domain uh, where you actually have alpha is two pi. It's really a very hard problem. Uh, and yet the method naturally goes in and produces the mesh. So that's absolutely fine. So those are the meshes that we get. We'll have a quick look at the errors of those in a minute. Um, but I just want to say something else. Um, one of the key things about meshes is that you want to understand properties of their regularity. Um, and two, two measures that are important. One is the, the um, scaling of the mesh elements. Um, and the other is the skewness. Um, and if you have a map with, with eigenvalues lambda one, lambda two as the map from one domain to the other, the scaling becomes the product of the eigenvalues and the skewness um, measure um, is essentially a ratio of the eigenvalues. That's this number Q. For a completely uniform mesh, um, the scaling is whatever you have, it's constant. Um, and Q is identical to one. Um, for an H adapted mesh, who knows what these numbers are? You know, <laughs> you can't do the, the calculations, but with the sort of meshes that we're talking about, the more Jampere optimally transported meshes, you can actually estimate these numbers absolutely exactly. Um, and here's a calculation that Simone did. Um, I was very happy with this calculation when he did it. Um, he came up with the estimate QK, uh, at the bottom uh, for the skewness, um, which shed, shows that providing gamma is bounded away from M1, so two thirds, for example, um, that the skewness can be exactly estimated. It's bounded away, it's, well, it's nice and finite. Um, it, it doesn't increase as you go towards the corner and it doesn't change as you change the uh, number of degrees of freedom of the mesh. So it does a really nice job of um, globally controlling what's going on. So let's look at some results. Um, so here are some results where we take the L-shaped domain and we compute the solution. Um, in this case, there is an analytical solution you can get by conformal mapping. So you know what the actual true solution is, and then you can see how the solution depends on the mesh. Um, and in green, we have the L infinity error as a function of gamma. Um, in the uh, red, the L2 error as a function of gamma. And as you vary gamma, you get a very sharp dip precisely at the optimal values that we've predicted of two thirds, and in this case, uh, a four ninths. So that piece of the analysis is right. Um, here's the error, uh, uh, again, as a function of gamma, uh, as a function of number of de degrees of freedom. Um, so the, the key thing here is to see that the black curve with gamma is zero. Uh, gamma is zero 
basically corresponds to a uniform mesh. Um, the uh, blue curve uh, is the optimal mesh, and you get much faster rates of convergence um, with um, the uh, on the left L2 and on, on the right L infinity uh, with an adaptive mesh than you do for a uniform mesh, far, far greater rates of convergence. Um, and also, you do very much get the highest speed when the monitor function accurately reflects the error. And the bottom two pictures show how the skewness and mu is another measure of mesh regularity called the shape regularity, vary with dimension. And you can see that dead constant as predicted by the, the theory. Um, here's a, a demonstration of the fact that the, the error for the adaptive mesh, that's the red, uh, is the mesh, uh, OT mesh, goes like um, essentially um, the uh, one over the dimension, which is the optimal rate. Um, the unstructured um, uniform mesh goes like two thirds, which is much slower. And if you compare this with H refinement, which is the green, um, we pick up exactly the same rate of convergence, if, if not better um, using, using this method. And it's much better than not using adaptivity. Um, and here is a comparison um, of the cost um, somehow we've managed to obscure the scale. I apologize for that. Um, but the, the top uh, few curves are um, H refinement with various scaling laws. Um, bottom, we have the uh, optimal transport Monjampe refinement with various scaling laws. And the um, Monjampe R refinement method is about two orders of magnitude faster than the um, H refinement method for producing comparable, if not better, results. OK, so I was pretty well finished there. Um, I, I, will, I just want to say that if you want to move a mesh result on the plane, then a good way of doing it is to solve more jampa type PDEs using a mixed finite element discretization. Um, and Quasi Newton works very well. Um, the great thing about this is you can prove regularity, and the methods work as well as H adaptive, but are actually much easier to implement. Um, where are we going at the moment? Well, the sort of work I'm interested in at the moment is adapting these methods uh, to, to building in these kind of more, more machine learning ideas where we, we learn the right monitor function. And this is clarity work with Imperial uh, and also uh, getting them to work on, on more realistic problems uh, and particular sort of uh, meteorological problems that, that I'm interested in looking at uh, solution on the sphere in um, uh, when, we, when we've got a very large and nonlinear systems. Um, and if anyone's interested, there are some uh, references. Um, and my student, Simone's thesis, I have here, aha, um, just about to be submitted, which has, has a lot of this stuff in it as well. Uh, and uh, with that, I will finish. And uh, thank you for your, for your attention. There we go.